So I'm Niels. I'm um, working in e-commerce as uh, IT project manager slash product owner. We are an um, agency based in Frankfurt. Um, yeah, building big e-commerce platforms for our customers. Good, lovely. Then we have Paul. Yeah, I'm Paul. Uh, I am a Scrum Master. I've been doing for about three years. And uh, yeah, the reference to Simon Wardley uh, is what caught my eye about this meetup. Uh, yeah, I've read some of his posts and the, the book, but haven't really seen it in practice. So uh, yeah, I'm interested to hear about that. Good, excellent. Uh, do I miss somebody? Petra? Uh, oh, yeah? There are Petra, Petra, and Monica. Okay. Monica? No, Monica? Okay, anyway, so we have a couple of uh, informations on the, on the chat. Okay, just, and have now X phone uh, addressing. So uh, I'm your host, my name is Pierre Nice, I'm a French German. I came here for Make Transformation for SAP and I'm an international agile coach and also a trainer and I'm working everywhere. So here are a, a, a couple of mates. So now I want to give the floor to Craig. Craig? Hi. So, Can everybody uh, hear me okay? Absolutely, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, so um, I'm uh, Craig Copern, um, and people sometimes ask me if I'm related to Alistair Copern, um, which I don't think I am. If we are, it's quite distant. But we do know each other and we do communicate, and we sometimes have jokes about how people always mispronounce their names. So uh, I am uh, working currently as an Agile coach. The, the background here is a, is a virtual background on Zoom, and it shows Canary Wharf, where I'm currently working although I actually live in Edinburgh, so this is unusual for me to work away from home five days a week. But normally I'm based in Edinburgh, and I've been involved with Agile uh, for more than 10 years, um, sort of about 2006, first got into it, and then worked as a Scrum Master, and then since about 2011, been working as a coach. Um, in my spare time, a bit like Pierre, I get involved in organizing meetups. So in uh, 2012, I helped to set up the British Computer Society Agile Specialist Group uh, based in London, but um, catering for members all across Britain. And uh, they organized the London Lean Kanban Days Conference, which used to be uh, in April, and has now been rebranded for 2020 as Lean Agile London. So quick plug for that one. Uh, but now that I live in Scotland, um, when I'm there and not contracting, I help out organizing meetups in Scotland as well with the, the, the different things there. So it's all quite a healthy, vibrant scene. And I like to sort of give back to the community. Now this, um, this talk actually, um, this will be only the second time I've given this in full. Um, the first time was at um, Agile to London in October. And that was the first time I've actually spoken at a conference. And that was the sort of debut for this particular topic. So I'm quite keen to get feedback on it so I can evolve it. I'm actually giving it in London in person next week. And the feedback at the conference is quite positive, uh, but I'm always uh, open to suggestions, um, particularly since um, some of the content mentions Brexit, which will hopefully go out of date quite soon. Um, but I won't bore you with the politics of all of that. So that's me and a bit of background. So um, if, if everybody's ready, I'll just sort of kick off. Now, when I gave this talk at Agile to London, it was sort of time boxed to about 40 minutes, but I'm quite happy to go a bit slower than that and to take questions and chat as we go. That'll make it a bit longer, but just to set people's expectations for how long this, this might be. Um, so um, if I put the, the share back up. So can you, oh, actually, miss that. can you see my, my screen? A bit, okay. Yes, yes, we can see your screen. Uh, Mark was asking uh, if the slides will be available after the call. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the slides are available after the call, and they're also on my LinkedIn, and I put them in SlideShare as well, because I gave them for the talk uh, in October, and they wanted the, uh, the slides to be available there. So um, also, um, I know that a lot of this talk, talk is about visualization, um, and I do appreciate that for a lot of people, they learn in a visual way. And um, as part of going to conferences, I'm aware of neurodiversity. Now, as, as part of that, I recognize that people have different learning styles. So some of these slides are a bit wordy, and I know that that's often frowned on a little bit, but I have made them wordy because I recognize that some people's learning styles are visual and reading rather than listening. So if they are a bit wordy, then you know, I know that doesn't quite work for everybody, but I'm trying to cater for all, all the options here. So this is the topic, it's about strategy roadmaps in context, because I often find that people were cutting and pasting and uh, uh, making up strategies that weren't really strategies, and they weren't very good at visualizing it. And those are my, my contact details if you want them. Happy to connect up on LinkedIn. Um, if anybody's got any questions or uh, anything else, them on Twitter as well. Now, uh, my next button doesn't seem to be working. I'll do that. So um, now, <clears throat> what I also noticed, and I often work in big banks, so I'm not going to criticise my current employer, but previously, uh, when I worked in big banks, um, I did notice that they were often coming up with strategies but the strategies were often thought of as being something for the C-suite and became a bit static and a bit PowerPointy and didn't really get updated or evolved very regularly. And But I, I recognise just through looking at this a bit more that actually strategy matters at all levels because if we make it transparent, a bit like quality, quality matters to all of us as well. So by making strategy transparent, visible, and part of how we all think and work, then actually it might help to address some of the things that go wrong with, with poor strategies. Um, so um, this is, again, a bit of structure around the talk, so you kind of know where you're at and what I'm going to cover. Um, that's the format. Um, our, our talk through a worked example um, and then give you a template you can use to take away a lot of this talk as well as the PowerPoint online. Uh, the uh, article that I wrote that's the basis for this talk as well as the template are all in Medium and the links to all of that are in the talk as well. So this is all self-contained with lots of links out. Um, so you can refer to that later on and that includes the template that I mentioned there as well as some practices to get going. Um, and of course, at the end, there's questions at the end. If there's uh, anybody got any questions, then, but of course, take, I'm happy to take questions um, as we go. Now, uh, the backstory for this is that um, I, about a year ago, went to talk by Roman Pischler, who's a very good speaker, and he spoke a lot about roadmaps and as part of that talk, he explained how a roadmap fits into strategy. And I'll show the diagram in a minute um, as to that. But then when, about, about the same time after going to see Roman Pischler talk, I went to another talk about by Simon Wardley. And I referenced Simon Wardley quite a lot in this talk because um, I really liked Simon Wardley's talk and the theory. Um, and I sometimes find Wardley maps quite useful. But Wardley maps have a particular context, which is often around technological maturity and value streams. That's the basis of a Wardley map. But, but not everything we do is about technological maturity. So say, for instance, an agile transformation isn't necessarily about technical maturity. Some Wardley is obviously coming from a cloud background. That works for him. And uh, I felt that Sometimes people, I noticed that people in my teams would go to Simon Wardy's talks and go, well, that was very interesting, a very uh, well-delivered talk, but I just don't quite get the relevance for me or us, because that's not the sort of thing that we are doing. And I sort of noticed there was a bit of a gap saying, well, I've got a Wardley map, but how do I then take that and practically start implementing stuff from it? Where do I begin? And what, what is the impact and how do I kind of plan different scenarios? So I started to then say, mm, there's a bit, a bit of a gap here. I uh, wrote a couple of early articles that got some good feedback. And then this is where this all sort of came from. It was understanding that, yeah, Wardy Maps are really useful, 
this practice I'm about to talk about sits quite happily alongside that, but you don't need a wordy map. And um, sometimes wordy maps relevant context and sometimes uh, your context that means they're not so suitable. So this is a, a standalone practice that can work by itself or it can work with a wordy map if you've got one. Uh, so I'm not trying to compete with either of these other tactics. It's just a simple, it's an extra tool for your toolbox. Now, Simon Wardley uses this example. Um, so um, what he gives here is um, a, an ancient battle in which there was, uh, this is the basis for the, the, the movie 300, I think, in which uh, there was an effective strategy, and that was to block the, the, the sea route, then forcing a battle on land, which was constrained by the mountains, and therefore the, the opponent that had lots, of, uh, lots more soldiers and a much bigger army, that advantage was then negated because they had a smaller front to fight on. So that's an example of battle strategy. And Simon Bordy makes the sort of joke that, well, actually, if we were to use a lot of modern management techniques, we'd use strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And as you can see from the SWOT chart of, yes, well, we've got a well-trained army and a threat of, well, there might be a dodgy film produced over 2,000 years later about this. It's not really so useful. And Simon Ward is very big on maps because maps give us context. You can see the relative positions of things. You can see movement. And we use maps all the time, really, for every day finding our way around. And that's the essence of a good map, is it helps you to find your way around, as opposed to a SWOT chart, which is really just a bit of a to-do list. And often we find strategies are to-do lists. So I thought, well, this theory speaks to me because it kind of makes sense. Um, I, I like things that are visual and I prefer to avoid things that are lists. And, um, you know, the old metrics of let's be the magic quadrant or be the leading army or win three battles these years, you kind of lose a bit of the context of well, why are we doing this at all? And that essence of the why of movement, um, I think really matters. Uh, I'll come on to that later. Um, but again, Simon Ward is quite big on speaking about the why of purpose and the why of movement. Now, just because I'm Scottish, I thought I'd chuck in another battle. This is a famous one called the Battle of Bannockburn. And again, effective strategy here over only two days allowed the Scots to defeat the English. And 700 years later, we're still singing about it. So uh, again, uh, an, an effective strategy was really important and allowed uh, a, an inferior force, the Scots, to overcome a superior force, the English, by using strategy to their advantage. And in this, there was lots of use of landscape. It was a battle. The landscape really mattered. Situational tactics, depending on you know the, the lie of the land and purpose. And it was only two days. So it wasn't like your big corporate strategies that are over four or five years. Here's a strategy just for a two-day event. And again, it's like strategy matters. However, you may well have heard this quote of culture eat strategy for breakfast. And um, I've heard this one a lot. And I thought I'd do my research, research on this because everybody says, yeah, well, of course, strategy matters, but isn't culture more important? But uh, when I did look into this particular quote, I found that, and there's the, the links to, to look it up, actually, Drucker didn't say that. Uh, the culture eat strategy for breakfast quote apparently derived from culture uh, uh, beats strategy for breakfast or cu culture eat strategy for breakfast, culture beat strategy, and, and then it originally what, it came back to some sort of health quote. So over the, over the years, it sort of passed in word of mouth and became misattributed to Drucker. And um, I then said, well, again, this is another example of copy and paste, and you lose the original context, the original meaning. A bit like Waterfall, because if you go back to the 1970 paper by Winston Royce and Waterfall, you see the, the seven steps of Waterfall. And then under that, there's the infamous words from the origin of Waterfall, I believe in this method, but it is risky and invites failure. And that's exactly what happens with Waterfall projects in, implemented in that particular way. And in the original Waterfall paper, Winston Royce then goes on to explain a lot of things to do to make Waterfall then much more successful, including collaboration, 
uh, iteration and involving the customer. So it's almost like an early go at Agile, but we kind of lost all of that because people just copied and pasted the first page with the seven steps. So again, I think that culture and strategy actually work alongside one another rather than competing. And again, this is what I say is this is about a cargo cult, which is just simply copying other people do without proper context. And we do see this a lot in agile transformations and agile rollouts. Oh, this worked for so and so, or let's copy the Spotify model, or let's do safe. It's worked for everyone else, but without really properly understanding organizational context. Now, this particular bridge um, even has context too, because this bridge is near Belhaven. In, uh, which is near Edinburgh. And it, it was uh, built, I think, about 100 years ago. And at low tide, the bridge has a stream going under it. And uh, the bridge basically provides access to a, a, a beach on the other side that allows people to access the beach from the car park and cross this deep piece of water. But it's, it's invisible at high tide and looks a bit silly. But actually, for most of the time, that bridge is quite useful. So. Understanding the context of the bridge allows us to understand it's actually useful rather than silly. Um, so context sort of matters if we're wanting to get the most out of things and understand the relevance. Now, <clears throat> another another thing that I did notice actually, um, particularly when I was helping people um, trying to talk about outcomes and get funding for projects and in banks where they had a bit of a stage gaty process and things needed approval for funding. They were always talking about, yes, it's always got to be outcome focused, but they ended up in a bit of like vocabulary wars because what one person thought was an outcome, another person didn't. So I think it's important as a team and, and as an organization to agree ways of working, including what definitions mean within your own context. And so for the context of this talk, these are the definitions that I happen to use that work for me. And of course, if you have different definitions, you can uh, you can use your own. But this is this is what I mean when I'm, I'm talking about strategy. It's coherent, which means it all sort of fits together. It's not got sort of big missing gaps, makes sense. Contextual, meaning it's relevant to your particular context and it delivers outcomes, which is what we often talk about in Agile outcome-based work. And outcomes are value because they help to support your vision, which is your desired future state. So they all sort of tie up together. The strategy is your plan to deliver it. The outcome is the thing you're trying to deliver that matters. And the vision is the thing that you're trying to get to. And tactics are things that you do in the strategy that make it more likely that the strategy will succeed. Because in an uncertain world, uh, which Agile is, but even in Waterfall, there's uncertainty. So you can't often guarantee things will happen, but what you do is you have supporting tactics that shift the odds in your favor and make it more likely that you will succeed. And a lot of this um, definition, again, you know, you see parallels. So things like mission and outcomes and objectives. Um, I, I see that the the vision of the future state is realized by the mission or outcomes or objectives, which are delivered by the strategy and supported by tactics. And if you've ever used a uh, practice called OKRs that um, has been quite prominently advocated at Google and, and others, they use um, OKRs as a kind of metrics based uh, strategy for setting forward goals and measuring three key results that you're getting there. And I'm trying to relate here how um, my definitions relate to that OKR framework because I often try uh, and relate to how people are working. And if they're using OKRs, they might then um, find this kind of uh, definition helpful. Um, and again, a, a to do list is not a strategy. And I often see this that people come up with strategic PowerPoints that are just a list. Um, now, again, your classic failure list here. Um, which to me, um, when we see uh, big failures in Kodak, Blockbuster, Nokia and Toys R Us aren't the only big failures we've had recently. But I mention them because um, a lot of the time their names come up in the context of Agile. Oh, they weren't Agile enough or, or, or they didn't adapt quickly enough and things like that. But I think that, you know, that's true. I mean, Blockbuster 
in a sense, did come up with things that were quite innovative uh, and were, in a sense, agile. But actually, a lot of these companies failed because they had a failed strategy. Now, and I say, say that because things like Kodak, well, as I say, we still have cameras. Kodak made their money off of cameras, we still have cameras. Blockbuster made their money off of films, we still watch films, uh, and similarly all the others. These markets did not go away. Toys R Us sold toys at Christmas time, which I understand is still a multi-million pound business. So it's not like the market just went away. The market is still there, but these companies got disrupted. Um, even though there was still lots and lots of money to be made, but they became disrupted because their strategy was poor. And sometimes in Agile, if you say, well, yeah, we're Agile, we can adapt, we can be flexible and everything else. By the time you spotted there's a problem, it might be too late. And sometimes, you know, that that is the issue. And I'll talk uh, uh, later on about, you know, uh, reactive Agile, which is, saying, oh yeah, we've discovered this and we now have to adapt. Balances with proactive agile is trying to anticipate what you think could happen and different pathways, but like a roadmap. So you're balancing both proactive agile and reactive agile. So you don't end up with the market shifting too late. And by that point, it's too late to do anything about it. Now, uh, I do talk a lot about, about Brexit, unfortunately here, so I won't bore you too much with the details. But again, there's lots of other examples of poor strategy in which when this tweet was written uh, uh, about a year or so ago that um, you know it's, it, Brexit is happening in a very waterfall way, there'd been a referendum and then we ploughed on with it even though the requirements might have changed and, and, and 6,000 people liked that because they thought it was quite funny and uh, yeah I, 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 a lot of people didn't really want it anyway and some people have obviously changed their mind but it's a bit too late to have a change request for Brexit. So. Um, there's lots of examples out there of uh, people being a bit uh, inflexible and, and, and poor strategies, rather than saying, well, potentially we think Brexit might be a good idea. Maybe we can try it out in some small way uh, and experiment, but that's not how it worked out. Now, um, when I look at um, actually, why does really strategy matter? Um, this was a survey, again, the links at the bottom of in which you know, back to the big corporate failures, uh, we see that actually strategy is the most critical behavior for the success of organizations. And apart from all those uh, actual examples, a survey of uh, 10,000 executives, 97% of them agreed. So this is how critical strategy actually is. And, and obviously culture didn't get mentioned here oddly. Uh, I mean, obviously I think culture is important too, but we recognize that strategy is, is pretty critical. Um, now, this is the word, most wordy slide, so I won't bore you with lots of words and lots of slides. But actually, uh, what we see again, this is from the Business Agility Institute report. Um, we, we understand that leadership really matters. Uh, and we, we talk an awful lot about mindset and, and how you know, leaders do. But actually, you know, what, what we really see is, is um, failed transformations, failed agile adoptions, um, lack of agile mindset, and, and really this is coming from the trenches in terms of data, that we recognize things as matters, but we're not really very good at it, uh, sadly. Um, now, I, rather than I'm boring uh, people in this talk with lots more examples, what I did do is built up a, a list of agile adoption failure patterns curated from things like the version one survey, uh, uh, agile seminars have been to talks, people like Michael Sohota, newspaper articles. So generally see like, yeah, you know, people on this call are all well sold in agile, but it often doesn't work. Is there some underlying cause or pattern to this? And I've collated that together in an article, which basically it does emphasize that things about lack of leadership, lack of effective culture change, and all these underlying reasons that, yeah, you know, Agile can add value, but often it doesn't really rule out successfully because of these uh, more systemic cultural problems. So <clears throat> then I said, well, okay, so let's let's talk about strategy in Agile context. This is back in the days when I was doing scaled Agile, and this is a, a, a PI planning wall. So off to Robin Pischler for a minute to understand where where does 
but it started to really fit into the big picture. And at the top, we see the company's got a vision, and that vision is realized through a business strategy. And also, as part of the company vision, they may have visions for what products could support this company vision. And then we see that the product strategy is the implementation of the product vision. So strategy is your plan for realizing your vision, but your product strategy also supports your business strategy. So this top circle shows how things all relate to one another. Um, but often teams work with product backlogs and the product backlog, often if you're uh, as familiar with Jira as I unfortunately am, can end up with hundreds and hundreds of issues in there and you need some sort of meaning and structure, otherwise where do you begin? And typically a product roadmap is a good way of doing this to get you a higher level view of what are the big things you're going to be doing in the next maybe six to 12 months and why they matter, maybe the big features or the things in your product. Things that you kind of um, put out the door that really, really matter. You know, when you're talking about products, you're talking about things that are maybe only released once or twice a year, if that. Not like, so Amazon, where you're deploying uh, uh, new content to your website every 12 seconds. In product land, obviously, the release cycles are much longer. Um, and on your roadmap, you may have key things. And from those key things coming up in the next few months, they then inform your backlog, because your backlog then is oriented towards the next key things. But the product roadmap helps to deliver the strategy, which helps to support the vision. So this is your context for how things way down at team level and product backlogs can sit within a roadmap to help to support a strategy, to help realize a vision, and ultimately might roll, may well roll up, or hopefully roll up, to help deliver things that are of corporate value. So this is the unending circle of why it's sometimes referred to. Or, or the analogy of the, I don't know if this is true or not, but apparently when they were sending a man to the moon, uh, the president walked around and asked the janitor uh, what he was doing. And he said, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. And everybody's really got meaning and purpose as part of that bigger picture. And, and this, pic, this slide here helps to kind of bring together what's going on in the backlog as part of that much bigger picture so everybody can see context so yes this all adds up to something bigger and more important now i'm now going into jumping from Roman Pistler off to simon wardley a little bit if you've ever been to the simon wardley talks he does do a lot of this um uh strategy cycle and this strategy cycle comes from uh, sun Tzu's uh, the art of war it's also the uda loop um which is um, Observe, Orient, Decide, Act from John Boyd, who is uh, in the US military. And this is the kind of what we'll call the strategy cycle. At, at, the, at the top right hand corner, you see purpose. So imagine, uh, um, it's like uh, playing chess, for instance. You might go, yeah, but why are we playing chess? You might, you might just like it, or you might want to win a tournament. Or, or you might think it's good for increasing your intelligence. There's a why as to why are we doing this thing at all? And then when you say, yes, this is a valuable thing to do, the rest of this diagram is the why of movement, which is in context, you're playing chess, you have the pieces before you, your opponent's made several moves and so have you. The board right now is context specific. So the next move you make is specific to the context of what the board is telling you. So and there's lots of options available with different probabilities and different outcomes. And so there's two whys. Why of why are we doing this thing at all? Why we're playing chess as opposed to some other game? And why of movement, which is why this move now as opposed to some other move? And and this is this is the two the two whys. So you start with your the why of purpose. Um and you move on to, to landscape, which is things that don't generally change very often or, or very frequently. So within the context of, of Brexit, landscape might be, you know, the uh, Conservative Party has always been divided over, over Europe and they wanted to settle the issue. Uh, the SNP was quite pro-Remain. So these things aren't likely to change too much. But climate is things that affect the landscape. So an example of climate would be 
um, you know, Boris, uh, Boris Johnson wanted to prorogue Parliament to uh, stifle debate, perhaps. However, uh, a number of politicians took him to court and won, saying that Parliament was illegally prorogued. And because the sheriff made a determination, the government made a determination that Parliament was illegally prorogued, then the Parliament had to be recalled. So that's an example of something that then changes. And because then Parliament was back, then they were able to have votes, debates, uh, decisions, uh, challenge the government, and so on. So, so landscape is generally things that don't change much. You just more or less have to accept them and, and, and work around them. Uh, they might change, but over a very long period of time. And climate are things that you can understand, affect, change, and um, they, 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 they kind of uh, uh, influence what you, what you should do next. And the doctrine is, uh, in Simon Wardley Land, there's a lot of uh, content on his website about this in much more detail, but doctrine is, uh, is operating techniques and beliefs that are, um, perhaps universally applicable, but not necessarily in your context. So there, there are sort of standard techniques and practices and you use them depending on what matters to you. And then from that, you then derive leadership, which is the context specific decisions, taking into account uh, all, the all, all, the, all the information beforehand. So then you're making proper context specific decisions and decisions based on knowledge and the situation that you find yourself in. So what I kind of noticed as well is that often strategy became to-do lists and missed out the people context. And one of the things that I'm a big fan of is Management 3.0, because it focuses a lot on people, on teams. And we see from a lot of the agile failure patterns that I talked about earlier that um, culture change was the difficult thing. So go like, oh well, yeah, strategy sort of needs people to be involved because people are kind of key. You're bringing them on this journey of change and articulating that via some sort of story helps. Uh, the culture and strategy side again, you know, that's that was about the, it's not just about culture or eat strategy for breakfast, it's about recognizing the two work alongside one another. And also if you look at the Agile Manifesto, um, it's individuals and interactions over processes and tools and customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Two of, two of those things, two of those values in the Agile Manifesto, half of the Agile Manifesto value statements are actually about people and them interacting with one another. So, you know, that is at really at the core of Agile. It's about people and interactions rather than just having to-do lists. And again, you know, I often spot that a uh, strategy is not necessarily updated. So having a practice of updating that regularly as things change, they may be as a result of uh, things changing that you anticipated were going to change, or it may be something unexpected happens. And, and therefore your strategy needs to be updated and reflect uh, current life. Um, as, as you see banks often sit in the strategies that are es essentially the same that last for three or four years. And I sort of wonder, is that really the most viable way to work in the modern in the modern era? So I noticed that these things are often missing. Now, I'll jump off slightly for one slide to um, a chap that I know called Ian McLaren Wallace, who won, who's heavily involved in the agile scene in Scotland, and he won an award. Um, let me see that at the bottom. The, uh, he won an award for excellent innovation in business psychology, and he. Um, all these things, human arcs. So these are like learning patterns. So as, as human beings uh, who are often missed out of the strategy thing, we have to recognize that all of this change is driven by, by humans and culture. Um, I think this uh, Keok, I think does a talk, value streams are made of people. Again, I'm trying to bring in the people side of all of this. Um, and recognizing that when people learn, things are maybe emerging or evolving or uh, unfamiliar, and there's all these different learning patterns of people before they can process knowledge effectively to be able to then act. And, and recognizing that people often deal with lots of uncertainty, it again undermines why, you know, underlines why, why, why is it the strategy is often fixed when the world around us is so not only variable, but our ability to process, understand, 
and then form opinions and, and decisions based on that is also, is also fluid. So um, again, there's a human aspect of this as well. So uh, this is the start of kind of trying to say, well, if you have a complex landscape, how do you actually form a strategy from that that, that kind of makes sense? Because certainly, you know, uh, un, I, I'd be lucky for you in Germany, but we've had the chaos of Brexit since 2016. And who's, no, you know, it, it's been difficult to really ascertain what's really going on. Uh, and people often get lost. Um, so uh, uh, from a from a sort of Brexit point of view as the as the model here, I won't I won't bore you too much in the way of politics, but I figured that if this kind of approach can deal with Brexit, which is very complex, messy and changing, then that's a, a good sign. It could well work in much more simplistic um settings where uh, it is not quite so um competitive and uh, changing and legalistic and whatever else. So if it works for Brexit, it could well work for you. And um, so again, context here is why bother with, with Brexit? What are the underlying motives? What might be the drivers here? Um, we understand obviously that people like the, 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 the unionists in, in Ireland favour Brexit because it put the border between them and the Republic. Uh, and, and so this is where the kind of landscape originates from, and we don't know really, I mean it's never been revealed what the motives of Brexit were, but perhaps it was just to make money in the stock market, perhaps it was to um, um, yeah, just uh, try to heal a rift in the Tory party, I don't really know, but it's useful to always know what the, the, the motive was. But in recognising this, this was the landscape of Brexit. There were competing groups, there were parties not collaborating, whatever. The Tory party was fractured uh, until very recently, the recent election, there was no clear majority. There were people articulating things in public, but perhaps having private strategies. There was people not willing to compromise. There was massive amounts at stake. And, and really there was very little to refer to as a reference. So it was very easy to get lost in all this mess um and the, but this static landscape was again in this diagram you kind of just have to accept that and work with it uh climate now this is climate um which actually rapidly evolved the clock was running down you know we've already had two or three extensions so the government lost its majority a few months ago uh, there was legal action that could change it there's lots of propaganda going on i mean all this is very dynamic and alters how we treat the landscape. Now, I will, uh, uh, the inspiration for all of this was way back. Um, I, I noticed that this gentleman called John Worth produced these things looking like flowcharts, but I realized they were a lot more sophisticated than that, in that they allowed us to understand Brexit. But um, the, at the bottom of this chart, there were a number of potential outcomes or intermediary outcomes. And at the top, it references like things like no deal or hard Brexit or Brexit delay or, or even, you know, uh, no Brexit at all. So there was a bit of a cross section going on here between time and outcomes that kind of made me understand, well, actually, uh, this is quite a useful way to visualize things and um, helps you to understand potentially different pathways to achieving the outcome that you seek. And um, you probably can't read the detail, but actually down in the bottom right hand corner, there's one outcome that actually uh, comes from over on the left. So that's an example of things looking unfavorable, but becoming favorable. And there's multiple routes and there's divergent routes and there's uh, different outcomes that can be achieved different ways. So it all looks quite complicated and, and messy. But he took a lot of time and effort to research the landscape. And from the landscape produces a very, useful predictive model. Now, if I, if I drop out the slide briefly and, and go off to his Twitter feed, um, you'll see that um, his diagram ever since the end of May, and this is in October, predicted successfully the general election is the most likely option, every single one. So a general election actually happened and so he's basically saying that his method works. And I was really inspired by that because this was just after my talk 
at um, Agile to London. And, and this is an example of when things are even complicated and messy, having a good understanding of the landscape really gets you the essence of what's going to happen. And, and it works. And um, further detail here is other Brexit prediction. He did these as a series, and the, the tweets are all up there. So basically, um, he said that every series he did over the entire year, despite this complex, messy, changing landscape, every single one predicted the right thing. Um, so C series two had a Brexit delay, which actually happened. Series three for a general election, and then that's what happened. And then series four showed that the Boris Johnson would get his deal, and that's what actually happened. So despite this messy, complex, changing landscape, it predicted things very accurately, which is quite an astonishing thing, given that, um, as he commented, although these, this practice was incredibly useful, I note at the bottom co about coverage in Germany, in the Netherlands, the New York Times, the, uh, the UK media kind of ignored it, which is a bit disappointing because these tools are quite useful. And, and I think that um, this sort of practice can help. Um, but back to, back to how, how you would actually use this yourself. And how does this work? So if I go back to back to presenting. So at, if you take the Brexit diagram, put it on its side, so the positions got meeting, um, and then look at the different goals on the diagram. You can then work backwards to understand a pathway. From that pathway, you can navigate that pathway, and that helps you to decide where things are splitting, where risks might occur. And also, unlike a lot of other strategies, this, this type of practice, if it's suitable, if it's relevant in your context, you can visualize what your opponents are likely to do. So you can superimpose your opponent's strategy on top of yours, and that then helps you make better moves rather than just uh, going away in a cupboard and deciding in isolation it's the right thing to do. Understanding what you're doing in relative to how your opponents are acting is, is quite a useful thing as well. So from this, you can develop a, a flexible context-specific strategy, which hindsight has told us that Brexit actually really works in terms of being able to predict things. But if the prediction isn't what you want to happen, you then change your behavior to shift the odds in your behavior, uh, shift the odds in your, in, in your favor. And this is proactive agile, looking ahead effectively, looking at optionality, and reactive agile is reacting to things that have changed both working effectively together. So what I did using all of that is to say, well, out of what was there, this is an old diagram. I did sort of joke that I was rather cutting a rod from more back by using Brexit, because everything was updating every day and I'd have to update my slides. But I said, well, I'll just take an example from the past to show you how you would use this. So back in this particular diagram, there were seven outcomes, depending on which one you favored, you then work backwards to understand the pathway so like the good ones are marked here in green, but you understand you're not always on the good path because you're at a risky point that could go either way. And uh, from this, you see the key points on the route that then allow you to use this route to devise the strategy that, that would secure a particular outcome and recognizing there's another way of achieving the same thing. So seeing the stages on this route allows you to build up a bit of a plan, recognize the risks, see what your opponents might be doing, act accordingly, and so on, and develop a natural strategy to realize the outcome that you want. Now, <clears throat> so, but from that, I then thought, well, let's simplify this a little bit because Brexit is quite complicated and messy. So from a, an agile visualization point of view, I then came up with this, this, this template in which, You've got time across the bottom, so you can see what's happening when, and you've also got increasing advantage. Now, the, the value of this type of a, a diagram is that you recognize, let's say you're doing a, an agile transformation, you recognize there's a problem to be solved. You want to be more agile or, or working in the ways that you're doing hasn't worked out so well for you. So therefore, you're starting from a perceived position 
down at the bottom left hand corner of the picture, which is a bit of disadvantage now, and he's progressing through the chart to a position of advantage in the future. And that's the traversal trend you would like to see. But the um, the, the five areas on, on, on this represent, if you think of this a little bit like a, fo a football pitch, in which a tactical gain would be you've scored a goal. You've not necessarily won the game because your opponent might score more goals than you, but a tactical gain is something scoring a goal. A tactical advantage is playing successfully in your opponent's half and keeping possession. You often see this if you're watching sports on TV, you see stats of the game and things like, you know, like tennis or football or rugby, you see these stats and they're good indicators as to how the game is going, even though they're not actually wins in their own right, but it's useful to understand the play. So if you're playing in a position of advantage, your tactics are different than if you're in a position of disadvantage. Neutral is in the middle, it's not really clear who, who's got the advantage there. Uh, and uh, moving down, you've got things that are advantageous to your competitors, so you want to avoid them. Um, uh, but your competitors might want to be play in that area. And then tactical losses, which your competitor delivers something. So that's the sort of parts of the of the pitch progressing across time. On the left, often missing from visualizations is your situational context is where have we got to now that brings us to this particular point? So that's visible, and therefore you're making context-specific decisions. And then on the right, you've got your why. So what is the vision we're trying to achieve ultimately? And what are the favorable outcomes that support that vision in order that the moves you make are in line with those outcomes? So there's no point in making a move and investing a lot of time and effort doing something if it's not in support of one of the outcomes you're trying to achieve. So again, you're just trying to get everything important out there and visualized so that people can see the moves that are being made in the con right context in support of things you've agreed are viable things to do. And also, if, it, if, it, if it's relevant, you might also see unfavorable outcomes in competitive division, so you try to avoid that. Now, <clears throat> so yeah, that's the template, but how does this really work in practice? If I, um, said, well, you know, understand the present context. Where are you now real, uh, re uh, realistically? Uh, there's tactics like future perspectives to say, well, how do we kind of think in the future? What might good look like? Things like future press releases, these sort of tactics about visioning future state to try and get the outcomes, um, outcomes crystallized to, to understand where is it we're going and why is that a viable thing. Recognizing as well that, in, particularly in an agile context, you plan to a realistic horizon. Now back when I showed you those tweets about the, the Brexit map, we saw different outcomes. One was, you know, a, a general election, one was a delay, and that, that reflects the fact that you can't always plan to great detail in the future. A, a realistic planning horizon uh, makes sense because beyond that, there's, there's too much complexity, there's too much variability depending on the context that you're working in. And also trying to then connect those future paths back to the present to understand your roots for achieving it. And then you can then refine that because, you know, the thing is producing a template here and saying this is how you use the template is, 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 is the easy part understanding the context of your business is the hard part. Uh, you know, I can't just come in and say, oh yeah, yeah I'll just, uh, here's your strategy. There's vast amounts of situational knowledge that exists in the business that I don't know about. And that's where, you know, the sort of domain experts really matter because they are the ones that can really dig deep to understand the, the, the business context, the different probabilities. You know, these Brexit maps were produced by looking at in detail at parliamentary procedure, about the law, and about understanding parliamentary numbers and what had happened, and uh, you know, you know, recognizing that sort of landscape and enough detail to produce a reliable model. And that's where business knowledge really comes out. Doing strategy, particularly when talking about multi-year, is hard work. 
you know, th this isn't easy. I mean, if it's, if it's over a couple of days, then fine, it isn't going to be a, too much a big deal. But but big long term surgeries are hard. Um, and recognizing things like, you know, actors and lines of influence really matter because that's what we see as things like Larman's laws, organizational structure, who are the people that are actually, you know, the, the influencers in this organization and who can make things happen. Uh, rather than just relying on naive organisational structures, which can help, but aren't necessarily how things get done around here. And then in the diagram, I say regular inspect and adapt via what I would call reflection points. So these are these like squares in here. These are the points on the map of which you then reflect and go, uh, yeah, has the future changed? Has something new happened? And how does that, um, how does that, affect what we should do next. Uh, that relates also to OKRs, because again, you're looking at your key results uh, to see are they in line with what we'd like to do. And also Heart of Agile, which is my sort of plug for Astor Coburn. He's very much in favor of uh, reflecting to improve in conversations as part of an improvement cycle. So again, that constant involvement of people and reflection as part of strategy in the changing landscape really matters. And that way you get your fluidity and adaptability based on um, you know, real reality rather than um, trying to predict too far ahead. Um, <clears throat> Kinefin also matters here. Um, again, we've got the, the four stages of Kinefin because uh, the, the, the state of things helps you to, uh, I suppose, plan at the right level. If something's obvious, maybe not much planning is needed there. Um, if something's complicated, it's reasonably predictable, the specialist knowledge. If something is complex, that's where Agile really comes to the fore because you're probing, sensing, responsing, um, and in and chaotic, you know, you're just really sort of acting. Now, um, you know, we're talking a lot about in Agile about hypotheses and experiments. They really, they really matter because we're dealing with uncertainty. But doing a hypothesis and experiment for everything is very costly. So if you recognise that they have most value in the complex space, then then you you, you plan accordingly. You you don't necessarily need to do experiments for everything. You can recognise that depending on the kinetic and state uh, of the work, that influences how you approach the problem. So if I say that the states, the reflection points in the strategy map should well map to how you perceive that to map to Kinefin, and that will then influence how reliably you can predict ahead. Because the further ahead you go, the more unpredictable it is. But if it's more complex, it's harder to predict ahead. So here, here's a bit of a, a simple worked example to give you a bit more meat here. Uh, and uh, this is taken from real life. Um, this is uh, a, a company trying to do an agile transformation. And it, uh, what they thought is that in order to be transformed, they uh, had some uh, people in old job roles, like project manager or program manager. They developed some new job roles, like release train engineer and scrum master and delivery manager and so on. They, they carefully crafted these job roles. And, and th this, this really happened, but I wouldn't name the, the, the guilty party. They sent it, this in an email saying, as part of our agile rollout, we're going to roll out these new job roles, and this is what the new job roles are. And, and then they thought that because that was then all rolled out, and people knew how new job roles as new roles, responsibilities, training pathways, career pathways, it was already detailed, very explicit. They were all very clear about what they were going to do, what their jobs were going to be, and therefore because they were all clear, hey presto, we were all transformed. And, and so, again, with this map, you're seeing the old job roles in this area of uh, there's a problem to be solved. We're migrating through the diagram to new job roles, which looks like we're in favorable territory. This looks like it might well work. All rolled out is a deliverable. Maybe somebody had that in their uh, achievements for the year as part of their annual plan. They've ticked their box. They've delivered something and hence we're transformed. So allegedly we're in having delivered a goal uh, in support of an outcome, we should all be uh, in the land of success and we can all go down and celebrate. However, the reality was more like this. 
uh, is that the uh, job roles were rolled out, but the people didn't expect this to happen. And they got a bit, uh, you know, culture of fear set in because they were worried. Am I going to have a job in this new land? I'm a project manager. Does that mean I'm going to be laid off? Uh, or uh, do I have to retrain as a scrum master? I'm not quite sure what that involves. Or this is being forced on us. And so you see, um, you know, the five dysfunctions of a team creeping in here, uh, lack of trust. And when people then have lack of trust, you then start to get resistance to change because people are worried, well, this agile thing all sounds very well, but hang on a second, if it's successful, I'll be out of work, don't really want that. And so you see the sort of symptomatic cultural problems arising that actually referred to earlier that lead to agile transformations not working. And this is exactly what happened in the scenario, that actually the expectation was it would be successful, and the reality was that it wasn't. But then when you start to get beyond fear and distrust, you need to then watch out because you can then get into the, uh, the goal area of negative goals, which is the then entrenched resistance, which is then a whole new level of uh, people uh, actively opposing change, saying things like, oh, our waterfalls worked for us so many times in the past, why should we bother? And, and you need a, an extra level of leadership uh, to deal with that level of, of resistance. Whereas if it's just a little bit of, oops, we've made a bit of a mistake, you can probably recover from that, not too, not too bad. But you've got to go watch out. And this is the sort of thing that happens of, of failure patterns in organizations. But by visualizing this, uh, you know, by, by visualizing this as a, as a more of a map, you can see that we, we wrote, you know, anticipated rolling out the new job roles and we anticipated that being successful. If you've not quite got the full um, four stages yet, you're rolling this out and you're saying, this is what we're going to do. We're going to roll out the new job roles and we think this will be successful. By visualizing that, you can then inviting inspection and feedback and people going, I don't think you think that's actually going to work. And then you can then place this on the map where you think it should be rather than just being overly optimistic. So by having a visualization practice, you're inviting feedback, inviting inspection, encouraging collaboration, and trying to then address some of the underlying problems that happen here. Because uh, you certainly don't want this to happen, but by saying, where do you perceive this next move to, to, to um, to, to be on the map in terms of increasing advantage. Somebody from HR might have then thought, oh, this is going to go really well. But somebody else who says, well, I worked on this agile transformation, it didn't work really well. You then collaborate where you think this should go on the board and then act accordingly um, based on that new information. Because in reality, it's probably more like this, in which you see multiple pathways coming in, and multiple pathways going out, and trying to visualize that more complex landscape in which failure still exists, but you're trying to avoid it. So rather than just the old job roles, you maybe involve a pilot group doing an experiment to pilot some new roles and see how that goes. And that, if it works, you expand the pilot, but if it doesn't work, you then change the approach. There's lots of different points here, but again, you're saying, this is the sort of approach we've got based on how we think things might happen. And this becomes a much more network-based approach to planning rather than just the linear approach of this or this, which only assumes one thing is going to happen and it's all going to be good. So you're actually visualizing risks and options and what you might do if things don't work out properly. And now again, if you, if you felt that these were un particularly uncertain, you can map them as, as different Kinefin states. And again, because of where you place this on the board in terms of time, when do we th think this will happen, an advantage, you're then able to provide feedback on, on what you think the, the riskiness of it is, or what you think the success of it is likely to be. So you then proceed accordingly, rather than being overly, overly successful. And Back to Simon Ward again, he, he does talk about this crossing the river by feeding the stones analogy of in a complex adaptive landscape. You are sort of putting your foot forward, seeing where that takes you, 
uh, and then put you forward again, and you're not always quite clear. So this is an analogy across the river by feeling the stones. Well, to take that into this map, the wavy lines represents the river, and the steps here represent the stones. So again, I'm bringing in a lot of Simon Wardley's theory and visualizing it with a practice that actually makes a lot of use of, of his actual theory as a, as, a, as a visualization practice using his language that people have, uh, have become used to because uh, Wardley mapping has taken up quite a lot. And I think the Wardley theory is really good, um, but the uh, Wardley maps themselves aren't necessarily always the, the best things to understand what's going to happen first and what's the effect of that going to be. So this is the sort of uh, analogy with Simon Wardley's River and Stones map. And again, the sort of how does this work with a Wardley map? Well, Wardley maps are about technical and maturity and value streams and that have a, that has a particular context. This is a slightly different context as it's not necessarily about technical maturity. I've used it in the context of Brexit and of agile transformations, but they can work quite successfully together. And um, they're not necessarily about technical maturity. And again, it's just a different visualization practice to encourage collaboration and conversations and to bring out the sorts of things about what is the work and what's coming up and, and do we think this is going to succeed or not as a visualization practice. Um, so see things like um, your know, impact maps and they're good, but this again, it's a different practice to kind of bring the work together and show how things are panning out across time. And I then saw that there's different sort of approaches here. We, we talk about agility now. Now, for me, agility is about this feedback loop. Uh, lean is about improvement, where things are much more predictable. But we often miss out the leadership aspect, of which is being able to lead from the front, being a people leader, thinking very much about culture, articulating vision, meaningful outcomes, being able to support the people, encouraging innovation where appropriate, and trying to anticipate the future. And I think the three sort of support one another quite effectively to bring about an effective strategy. And, and therefore, just to sort of summarize, I'm almost at the end. Uh, good strategies require context rather than cut and paste. Uh, good strategies are more than to-do lists because those diagrams showed that actually you're relating your moves and outcomes versus what your competitors might do. And you've got the context of why, because you've got your outcomes on the board. Uh, strategies, as I said as well, everybody can take part and contribute. Uh, you know, you can have it for a two-day battle. You can have a sprint plan is actually your plan, your strategy for delivering your sprint goals within a two-week period or so. So again, I think the strategy is important at multiple levels because it helps all of us. We should all start thinking about that. Uh, if we regularly adjust, we're good at um, then uh, dealing with change. Uh, anticipating things that take us down dead ends means that you don't end up like blockbuster of the landscape changing and it's too late to do anything about it. It's all about people at the center of things rather than, again, just uh, uh, um, to-do lists that get sent down from above. And also by making this public and uh, visualization practice and putting it out there, we all see the same thing. So you can then draw on the wisdom of teams and go, well, actually this is a strategy and somebody, whether they're at the top of the organization or they're down at the team going, I don't quite agree with that. But by articulating things in a visual way, we can uh, support alignment and autonomy and provide feedback. So uh, that's a sort of summary. But uh, I then realized that people like takeaways from these sorts of talks. So I realized that actually the takeaway of doing it this way versus the traditional way, there's actually a lot of advantages. And here you go. So these are what I perceive to be the advantages of having strategy as a visual map rather than just a simple to-do list. Uh, and again, there's a lot on that slide. Um, but again, the one at the bottom really matters because everybody's been able to share the view, same view, provide feedback, and it's all about conversation, uh, which is the essence of Agile. So um, for further reading, there's a, a few books that I kind of reference indirectly in here. Strategy Maps is quite a good book uh, that, that talks a lot about this sort of thing. Um, the uh, various talks of Simon Wardley and Rowan Pitchler. Declaration of Interdependence is another thing that Alistair Coburn did after he did the Agile Manifesto. 
and it's much more oriented towards projects. It's obviously less famous for that particular one, but that was the sort of next evolution for him in this Declaration of Interdependence was about you know people and how they work with one another. Um, so that's the, the sort of further links, and that's that's the end of the talk. So. Um, Thank you so much, Craig. I will then stop sharing. <laughs> Any questions, guys? You can wake up. It'd be great to see the Declaration of Independence on there, too. Tongue in cheek, guys. There's a joke. Um, What was your question, Paul? Um, uh, Craig, uh, good content, really good, really great stuff. Um, uh, have you ever seen, you mentioned um, utilizing a, uh, a map for um, a, uh, a sprint. Have you ever seen anybody map out a sprint where they they put in failure well um so 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 a typical sprint plan is is you know people just think of the sprint plans as being the last of years or whatever two years and but i say no no a sprint plan is is important because it shows key dates or or what stories are proposed to do first or or who's available so that's you know your your traditional sprint plan but back in the um if I actually start the share up, as a, a very early version of this, I started thinking about, well, actually, this concept is uh, quite uh, quite sort of generic. And if I do... Um, here. I think it was this one. Uh, I, I came up with a, um, um, this is my earlier one, if I go to the, um, the talk, I thought I had it there. I did do a, a, a plan for a sprint. Now people, this sort of been did a slightly mixed because I thought it was a bit, um, a bit, a bit too novel, but um, if I, uh, maybe I can find it quickly. Um, I, I did do a map for a sprint because what I was trying to show is the, um, wh what, what I noticed was that often teams get bogged down to, into, I'm doing this JIRA or that JIRA, uh, and they would lose sight of really what's the point of the sprint which is obviously about meeting the sprint goals. Now, uh, I, I tended to find that a sprint goal maybe comprised like three or four activities or, or, or important things of value. And, and obviously you've got your backlog, which is the implementation of that. But uh, as a product owner coming in, and maybe a product owner is not terribly technical, they're not necessarily interested in the technical details of what the developers are interested in. They're just interested in, well, yeah, a burn down matters, but actually what really matters is maximizing work not done. So a burn down is only so much value there. What really matters to the product owner is how are we getting on with our sprint goals and how are we uh, you know, seeking out to achieve them? So the map of how do we deliver the, the sprint goals um, I, I put together as a, as a conversation piece to see whether people would, would get that um, thing. Um, I thought it was quite a useful approach, but um, it was, um, there it is, that's the, that's the one I was looking at. So this is how you could use mapping in, uh, as part of a, um, as a team basis, because I found this uh, sheet often shows what happens. The people talk about yesterday, today, and blocked, and it's just a list of JIRAs. I mean, that, that shouldn't really be what, it, what it's about. As a product owner, there's the map. So this is the earlier version of which you've got success at the top, failure at the bottom. And this is showing time across the top versus success. So it's showing 
the progression of a goal in a day, uh, and this is sufficiently lightweight, you could maybe sketch it in a meeting, then you can take that away and have a conversation with your stakeholders and say, well, actually, here's the map of this particular, um, you know, uh, uh, the next 24 to 48 hours. We expect this goal, this goal as part of the overall sprint goal to be done. We expect the second goal to move forward and we're not going to be able to start the goal three yet because we're busy doing the other stuff. And this is how the teams are actually interacting with one another. We've got uh, some devs together, another dev's going to support them from the afternoon and then they're going to be able to get that done. So that's our approach of, as I say, it's like the movement of players in the football field, a bit like scrum and rugby, which is where uh, you know the, the whole scrum analogy came from, of visualizing who's interacting with who when. So you're actually visualizing your individuals and interactions and your progression of sprint goals is a way of using this type of practice to kind of then show how are we getting on and what are the interactions. They might not want to do this every day, but as a, a practice once in a while, you're able to see who's interacting with who and how things get done in the team in a more dimensional way than just simply moving across a Kanban board. Well, and, and Craig, what I also, I, I see here is, is, you know, whether, you know, it's a product owner or a scrub master or whoever, right? No, you don't have to say anything about that, right? Mm -hmm. The team can just look at it and say, oh, wow, we, we need to get moving, right? Um, mm -hmm. Right. Or we're not going to get X or Y done. Is that okay? Right. Yeah, and and Kanban well, boards are very useful, but they don't actually show you the progression of the sprint goal. They show you the progression of the of the stories. So sometimes you lose that higher level context of how we're getting on towards delivery of sprint goals. So if they've got like three or four in a sprint, and that wider conversation, because it should function as a good information radiator. So for wider stakeholders, a Kanban board is maybe not that much use to them, whereas this type of map is because it relates to their business language and the goals they're trying to achieve. Think, is it by any chance is that article included or can you um put it in the chat could you put that link in the chat is that possible yeah so Thank if, you. Um, the, um, there's something valuable there um at least for, i i know for myself i felt like there was Thank uh, you. Can I... you click on the bottom it was when when you have this bubble it's called chat oh there it is <laughs> <laughs> so there and the other links are in the talk. Now, when I put that out, a lot of people sort of poo-pooed it and there wasn't very good, good feedback. I, I think it's useful. You might not want to do it every day, but it's a useful t thing to do because I've been in a few places where management tries to be a bit top heavy and a bit too much micromanagement. And sometimes they want almost like status reports coming out of the daily scrum. Now, obviously that's kind of dysfunctional behavior, but rather than just, minute taking in a daily scrum, yes, that is actually a thing I'm afraid to say. Say, well, rather than do that, I'll show you this diagram instead. So it gets them thinking in the right mindset and uh, facilitates a better discussion. And you might want to do this every once in a while uh, as a way of just visualizing how the team functions. Thank you. It replaced the daily burned out chart. So um, I, um, uh, in these diagrams, I have success at the top uh, because I believe that um, the it, it's almost like the 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 duns at the top, and that's things that are good enough to release. I tend to put success at the top and uh, problems at the bottom. So, because you're progressing towards success, things move upwards in these sorts of charts generally. Um, but yeah, burn down chart helps, but burn down chart relates to. Oh, yeah individual tickets and hours spent rather than the thing they're trying to achieve, which is success and, and goal achievement. So a burn down chart is only a proxy for achieving your goals. So I, I see I see the exercise, I see the, the logic behind it. What I see also is we are getting a little stretchy in, in some kind of micromanaging, which is a little bit anti-agile, but yeah. I see the exercise. I see here the value about more about alignment from through different teams. So let's say if you have uh, teams across the globe, it's very interesting to say, okay, this is my, let's say an evolution of this the, the daily burn down, yeah. the spring burn down. Say, okay, if we make more uh, support here and then there. Mm -hmm. and the other way around is 
You see, there's very little forget. reference to actual Jira tickets here, and I'm trying to push the focus yeah. more towards Sprinkles. Yeah, no, no I, saw, I, I I like the idea. I would just say, had the sprint is just a tactical approach. Is yeah. the purpose of the sprint is having already a, a strategy, and and, yeah, and, it, and it's better. It's obviously a lot better than that. So, again, again, yeah. this is just me doing a bit of an experiment to see yeah, good. could this work. Uh, it's obviously not for everybody, but um, I then evolved it into later articles that are much more higher level. Um, there's also uh, um, a company, consulting company, Agile 42, using something similar. It's called the Agile Strategy Map. Uh -huh. Not that detailed, but it's quite interesting. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, Simon Wardy makes a big deal about what's a map and what's not a map, and he talks about mind maps. He goes, they're not maps, they're just diagrams. And, and he yeah. has a detailed explanation of what really constitutes a map. So that, and, and a map has relative position and placement matters rather than, uh, and, and you can use it to navigate with. Now, obviously, I've got time in mind rather than, 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 than position. But I think that a, a proper map allows you to see where you are and where you want to get to and the routes for getting there. Because um, in, in the other article that I, um, in fact, I've, I've referenced this in my um, coaching links. This is one that I did bookmark the product delivery map. This is the one that sort of set me off in this tactic in much more detail in this last mm -hmm. March, in which I took the body map and went, well, how do you really get from there to there? Um, and I, I use a bit of the Brexit maps, but I say, this is a real map, right? So if I live in, Lon in Edinburgh, I'm trying to get to London, here's a map. A map in itself is not sufficient because the first map here shows me that there's actually four ways to get via uh, public transport uh, from Edinburgh, London, uh, uh, Edinburgh, from Edinburgh to London. There's four ways using uh, different trains. There's also, by car, there's three different sensible routes. And then if you go to the sky scanner and just say, I want to go from Edinburgh to London, there are actually 2,095 options. So a map itself is not enough. You need to know what is the... Uh, the way you prioritize and evaluate the different options to then understand which option is best for you now. That's thinking much more like chess. It's like thinking, well, there's lots of valid moves. Which one's the best? So how do you weigh up the why of movement? So this is what took me to uh, the, 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 the strategy map concept of understanding. Uh, yeah, and if you understand you well, and your demonstration is so context matters also. Yeah. So this is valid if you're going to work from Edinburgh to uh, London. But now if you want to take your family and going and making holidays to London, it's a different story. Yeah, yeah. And, and also yeah, like, and then understanding, uh, you know, context of like, uh, what choosing plane versus uh, train, that then determines what do you do next as part of your roadmap. Well, if you're flying by plane, you need to book a ticket and you might need to book a taxi. You wouldn't necessarily need to book a taxi if you know, the, the, we're going by train because you can maybe take the bus to the station. So what you do next as your first steps matter as part of your long-term thing you're trying to do. Uh, if I just go to, uh, again, uh, uh, where was it? That was here, uh, after coaching talks. This is the full, the full article that I then condensed down uh, it says 60 minute read, there's, there's other things here, like a video or whatever else. But this is basically the, 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 the detail and theory behind that, that talk, including a lot of the Simon Wardley thing, and then using some future use cases not got into yet. But this is the, the whole Wardley mapping theory and practice that I reference. The link to this is in the, is in the slide deck. Um, Thank you. But there's, there's all this further reading and how we got there and Roman Pischler's talk uh, and, the, and the Brexit stuff. Yeah, unfortunately, so, I, it's been, uh, so I'm, I'm very thankful because you bring this uh, on, on, a, on a table and in, when we discuss this company doing agile transformation, the, the biggest points we struggle with is strategy, a lack mm -hmm. of strategy. And we discovered also working with big boards is that even strategy has been outsourced to consulting companies. 
-hmm. So we have no mm -hmm. longer strategists. We have uh, just uh, managers. Yeah. And that's, and, and, and the consequence is, does the teams say, okay, we love to be engaged or uh, to work hard, but where do we want to go? We don't yeah. know. And that, really understanding this, I mean, we get this actually a lot in Management 3.0, is things like team purpose. And, and all this purpose, you know, what is your organizational purpose? What's your organizational vision? What's the why of the company? Simon Sinek talks with the start with why, and that works at every level. You know, it works at the team level, it works at the value team level, it works at the organization level. Start with your why, your why, and then you try to say, well, why is this a valuable thing for us to be doing? Then you work backwards to say, and therefore, what are the supporting steps to do it? But all too often, we see agile transformations coming in with consultancy saying, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Spotify model works somewhere else, we'll just bring it in here. And the whole why is is, is kind of lost. And, and, and people like... Um, uh, the um uh what's his name the uh, agile coach coach is saying like we're not trying to sort of it's michael sota we're not trying to do agile or be agile but what we're recognizing is that you know people talk about doing agile and just following the stuff and being agile well oh, that's so much better but but michael sota sort of poops that and say even being agile isn't enough what it is is recognizing and what the organizational goals are and then recognizing where agile can help you with those goals and therefore you're getting the the relevancy and purpose so you're then getting that motivational forward factor rather than just again a bit of the cut and paste while everyone else is doing agile so let's just do it as well you're getting that what is the the purpose and goal for which agile can help us in this particular context and that's where i'm trying to shift the thinking and and by putting that and visualizing it and having it on your team board and seeing it every day, hopefully it can then encourage that alignment towards that goal, which is obviously, these, these maps then sort of scale up. I mean, I talked a lot about Brexit, but actually the, um, the, the, the reason that the outcome happened and that the general election went the way it did was about the strategies that different parties had. And so you could see that their strategies would then interface into the Brexit strategy. So actual strategy maps actually link up as part of bigger plans. It's a bit like Kanban boards. They work at multiple levels and they almost like talk to one another. So it, it, to me, it feels like it's, it's the right way to go by making it visual to foster collaboration. And you know, people having maps that work in their context, but actually interface to the bigger picture. Excellent. Uh, another question in the audience. Um, I have a yeah, uh, you're far away from the microphone. Sorry. So uh, when we look at the Brexit map, um, they also came up with probabilities within the map. Yeah. How are you uh, actually coming up with your probabilities when you do your maps? Well, I would say that the the the, 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 the it was quite astonishing that the Brexit map had those probabilities and somebody was able to do that. But I think that, you know, and they were, they were remarkably accurate as well, uh, is that rather than going down to the nth degree, it was useful enough to say this thing is highly unlikely and this thing is the most likely thing. And if that's kind of good enough for your context, it's probably good enough. It's a bit like story points, right? You know, uh, if it's good enough to kind of work with, you don't need to estimate things to the to, to great level of detail. The Brexit maps did, and that was obviously a lot of work for him. Uh, it's difficult to really say if the, those probabilities were accurate or not, but uh, they also then fostered uh, feedback. I would say that in an organizational context, even just saying sort of t-shirt sizes, you know, that sort of level would, would perhaps be sufficient. Again, the amount of effort you put into this uh, it's, it's a bit of diminishing returns, you know, because obviously it's something that's going to flex and change, a bit like a Gantt chart. If you just put too much detail in it and too much work, you're just creating a rod for your own back. But at least having a, a bit of a, a finger in the air or guess around the room, we think this is, you know, most likely, but this could happen and we just need to watch out for it, it might be sufficient. Oh, Paul is coming. Um, yeah, you, talk, you talked a bit about the kind of strategy by template and um, yeah. yeah, that it's um, just kind of box filling and not actually analyzing a situation and mm -hmm. diagnosing a plan 
uh, to uh, help you from where you are in your context at the moment to somewhere where you want to be. Yeah. Um, do you have any... I, did, I did see this a bit in, in banks. I'm just sort of Googling it a bit. It, it did become a bit sort of PowerPointing, goal focused. Here's your to do list and the goals then just cascaded down. Which. Yeah, do you, you do, know, like, in terms of like building understanding uh, with whoever the leader is or the decision makers in that in the context that you're in mm -hmm. uh, for like what what actually is strategy and um, what questions it's trying to answer like yeah how, how, how do you like get get the group involved in like the necessity of like a visualization of a plan yeah so um so the, the the background of all of this is i've been writing this and talking about this for for about a year my organizational context has tended to be more slightly kanban so it's been more about improving things rather than a lot of you know, adaptive stuff with agile um but I've, I've sort of observed the problems and, and built this in response to it but the language in here you know i see you know the the problems that the teams were having of everybody wanted to be outcome focused therefore okay so let's just put the outcomes that the stakeholders want up there on the wall and look at you know the uh, the situation now and make those outcomes visible and even just having a conversation around outcomes and making them clear and visible because actually when i started to dig deep in in another bank and saying well what are the outcomes of what are the goals surprisingly they were very difficult to find they weren't even just on a powerpoint and a sharepoint somewhere they were they were like out of date and they were in multiple places and, and i just found like at least bringing them together was 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 one big achievement and then making the visual and on the wall was another big achievement and people just felt they were much more involved and you know when we were building a roadmap out for a particular product um uh, last year and then putting in the sort of key things we could then suddenly build this roadmap in the sort of Roman Pitchler sense of here are the big sort of deliverables and here are the reasons why those deliverables matter and th this is then why those deliverables then contribute to the overall outcomes we're seeking to achieve so suddenly everything started to make sense and the team found this a much easier way to work of actually having proper goals and alignment and seeing how the uh, the interim deliverables would contribute towards that goal and then you can then start to employ strategy and say, well, actually, suppose we swap these two things around. Does that decrease risk or increase risk or, or whatever? You're then able to have those conversations and do things like um, things like weighted shortage job first to understand what makes sense to do first. But also, what's the impact of that? Where does that take us? You know, uh, and so I, I just sort of found that doing this with a team really facilitated those discussions a lot better and you know, it helped us to get that roadmap together. Cool, thanks very much. Another question? No questions? Uh, if no questions, then we are done. So I'm okay. um, very thankful. Well, thanks for, um, thanks for listening and um, any feedback, uh, if you want to send it to Pierre or myself, always welcome to evolve this. Um, I've had quite good feedback from some quite respectable coaches and I'd like to try and evolve this and if it's if it's not very well explained, then I'd like to you know, change that and adapt it so it's easy to explain and just get the practice out there. So um, any feedback, feed, good feedback and I'll take that on board. Okay. Lovely. I just wanted to add a Happy New Year to everyone. Oh, yeah. Happy New Year. At the end, did you say? <laughs> and, and the other way around is, so uh, Azure Practice is a platform for everyone. So if you want to have a talk, so you get recorded. So any kind of talks are welcome. Is a platform of exchange. So I will try to do my best to edit very fastly these documents. And uh, Craig indeed will have it this evening, uh, the raw material. So you can do whatever you want with it. And so the next session will be in two weeks. And what's so the best way of getting the slide deck out to everybody? Is what? What's the best way of sending everybody the slide deck? Uh, I will use the, the media platform. Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. So it's on SlideShare. I can, I can just share yeah. that just now. If, 
that was my idea, just to give the link of the oh, start yeah, chapter yeah. put in the discussion. Yeah, okay. Everybody got it. Okay, my okay. friends. Thank you so much. Enjoy London. Thank you, Paul, for joining. And take care. Good to see you. Cheers, Marcos. And uh, cheers. Cheers, AR. <laughs> and I'm closing the sessions. Thanks for attending here. Okay. Good evening. Bye bye. Cheers. <laughs>